Retcon is a shortened word for retroactive continuity. It's basically changing or rewriting what happened before, which ends up in a contradiction. The contradiction itself might be no big deal, or it could be huge, but it's the impact of that change which will always alter the universe in a bad way. This usually occurs through something called gameplay and story segregation. So I hope to look at a few retcons and a few inconsistencies between what we're told and what actually happens, as well as some gameplay issues. What makes Mass Effect 2 good is not necessarily the storyline, the gameplay, visuals, or the changes made from the first game. And it's most certainly not the plot. It's the universe itself. It's the atmosphere, those magical alien worlds and characters you get to explore and interact with. It's that overall vibe that every piece of media has as our minds suspend disbelief. It's the same for the original Star Wars, Dune, or even the Blade Runner movies. The problem is Mass Effect 2's retcons and some of its expositions damage this atmosphere and muddle an otherwise established setting, lore, and overall feeling. Let's look at the most obvious retcon of them all. Weapons. In Mass Effect 1, guns had weapon mods which changed how they operated and had a heat bar to determine when the gun couldn't fire anymore due to overheating. Aside from the guns popping out and folding up on one's back, it made guns in Mass Effect unique. In Mass Effect 2, guns no longer have weapon mod slots or a heat bar, which means we've lost an entire culture, economy, and gameplay customization. Instead, guns now require things called thermal clips. The only explanation is from the Codex, which tells us this was because the Geth found winning battles statistically involved higher rates of damage per second, to constitute a faster output of shots fired since soldiers had to wait for their guns to cool down before they created ejectable heat sinks. Now, this isn't the retcon. The only two guns that are really designed for high rates of fire outside of using one's abilities are the assault rifle and the small machine gun. So, how does a Mass Effect 1 assault rifle with frictionless material weapon mods have a lower damage per second than any Mass Effect 2 assault rifle? How does higher DPS on a pistol work? How about a sniper rifle or a shotgun? If the issue is rate of fire, why would those types of guns even be considered to have thermal clips installed? Everyone else, luckily, has an infinite supply of thermal clips, except for you. Now, that would have been some cool AI if they suddenly ran out of ammo and charged you, but no, they'll just keep shooting, reloading, and shooting. Even more annoying is these clips are universal for every gun. The problem is, when you run out of clips for the gun you're using, you can't use your clips from your other guns. Despite touting a higher rate of fire, the path of the shots fired for some guns are suddenly now visible, even though they supposedly travel faster than light. Taking this ill-conceived idea even further, the Mass Effect 2 universe introduces power cells, the generic do-it-all heavy weapon ammo. These things are thermal clips on drugs. Whereas the clips are used for various kind of bullet shooting guns to absorb heat, power cells can power any kind of weapon. How is a power cell able to provide ammo for a flamethrower, a missile launcher, a grenade launcher, a black hole gun, and then some, as well as providing thermal clips? It's like someone took the thermal clip idea and went as full retard as they could possibly go with it. So we went from unlimited ammo with potential cooldowns and with weapon mods that could make your gun never overheat, to limited ammo for every kind of weapon with no cooldowns, even non-mass effect weapons, a lower rate of fire, and slower bullet speed. Not only are changes usually made for the better, but these changes also contradict what the Codex described it would improve upon. Anyway, those were the problems with the change. The three examples that best showcase where this retcon royally screws up the narrative are, immediately after being resurrected, how does Shepard know what thermal clips even are? This pistol doesn't have a thermal clip. After 10 years, how do the people on Jacob's loyalty mission have thermal clip-based guns when they weren't even invented? And if so, how come they weren't already used up? How does Zaid's gun Jesse, which is older than Shepard, use thermal clips when they weren't also invented? And what the heck are those brown rods next to Jesse? Are those supposed to be bullets or ammunition blocks? And this is all so we can have this. This. I always like to savor the last shot before popping the heat sink. And this. And this brings us to the next weapon change. Ammo powers. Since weapon and armor mods were removed and grenades and their mods were taken out entirely and turned into a heavy weapon, we're stuck with these class-specific skills called ammo powers. 
That is, certain classes can make any bullet type gun shoot different kinds of bullets. Here's an analogy. Imagine you have a black box called gun. Now, this gun has some buttons on it for certain skilled people to press, which in turn makes the gun shoot different ammunition. How is this a skill based on a class and not the operation of a black box itself? The only one that makes any sense is warp ammo, which somehow makes the gun absorb biotic attacks from enemies and then coats their gun's bullets in the biotic field or something because the black box can't make biotic fields or something. Wait, that raises even more questions, like the man-machine interface and how one stores biotic energy in a gun. That sounds even more complex than making a giant bubble. This ammo power can also become squad warp ammo, whereupon the user can simultaneously make two other people's guns do the same as theirs. What is this, like telekinetic battery gun networking Wi-Fi? Is that even possible? Have we surpassed the brain telepathic telekinetic network technology barrier? Even worse is their squad ammo powers for the others. So does that mean you're hacking your squad's guns? Why can't you just tell them to press the buttons themselves? But we can't because, you know, somehow this is a skill. Then there's a part in the game where Shepard has the choice of picking up only one of three gun types. Even though they pick up all kinds of guns previously, even if they do or don't have all the space on their back to store it. If for some reason picking up a gun at this time in the story, which happens to be on the collector cruiser, they decide to now start carrying it and using it, even though we have an entire armory of every type of gun. So when exactly was this weapon training? Was it back in Mass Effect 1? Was it through osmosis? Why can't Shepard pick up all the guns? Shepard had no problem in the first game carrying and using all the guns. Heck, so did everyone else. They all sure liked pulling out assault rifles a heck of a lot. At least they had them on their backs in the first game. And we're not even going to talk about what this is about. It actually makes sense that in the future we have these special spacesuits that are filled with this magical gelatin that heals one's injuries, but how does Metagel heal Legion? And does Space Spandex have a Metagel exoskeleton in it, like in the first game with armor mods? Talking about armor, what the hell is every store doing with N7 armor pieces? What, are there thousands upon thousands of requests from customers? Do N7 agents from the Alliance have to buy their own armor throughout the galaxy? What about all the N1s or N6s? Do you need a license? Or how about non-N Alliance Marines? What the hell is an N7 officer anyway? The first game didn't tell us, and we were actually part of the Alliance at that time. Heck, now they even make fabrications of N7 armor. Is there an abundance of these guys? There's clearly an abundance of jackets, shirts, and caps on sale right now. Heck, you can get your N7 gear today. Whatever the heck that means. We got N7 missions and collector editions. Huh? Another retcon happens with the Guardian lasers. Now in both games they're explained in some detail in the codex. Unfortunately, their use in the story ends up being incorrect. Guardian lasers stands for General Area Defense Integration Anti-Spacecraft Network, which consists of anti-missile and anti-fighter laser turrets that are on the exterior of a ship. This is why the Mass Effect universe doesn't really have any small, fast-moving fighter-style ships like we see in other science fiction. The idea behind it is that lasers travel at the speed of light, so anything that isn't as fast as light is going to get shot down. That's a smart idea. Additionally, lasers go right through kinetic barriers, so they'll bypass any defenses, their only weakness being they overheat. We're told by a codex entry in the first game that Alliance frigates are equipped with the Guardian systems, including the Normandy. Considering the SR-2 is an advanced version of the SR-1, it's assumed they keep the Guardian system. On Horizon, the Alliance Guardian laser turrets have a targeting software problem which is easily fixed. However, it looks like the turrets are firing missiles or bolts or something. The lasers apparently can't penetrate the kinetic barrier of the collector cruiser, which seems to be causing explosions? Eventually it does penetrate the barrier, hitting the cruiser directly, and it takes off. The other instance is after passing through the Omega-4 relay, the Normandy comes in contact with these flying spheres called Oculus. Now, some get shot down by some forward guns, which is either the Thanix cannon or the Javelin torpedoes, because the Guardian turrets are automated. But where are they? The Oculus have lasers that eat through the hull without a problem, and eventually they just burrow right through it at three points. So why hasn't Edie shot these things down yet? What's the holdup? Also about the Normandy, and this is just a minor thing, when it crashes on the collector base, why doesn't it disintegrate it like this? The plane atomized with the impact. 
Also, is there some kind of life support or breathable atmosphere in space? I mean, really. Usually retcons are a result of the developer specifically altering established content with new exposition on it. In this example, it's the lack of exposition that causes the conflict. Cerberus in Mass Effect 1 was an Alliance initiative before going rogue. We find out through a series of side missions that because of it, Shepard could have lost his entire squad due to a Thresher Maw attack and left them emotionally scarred for life. Yet, in Mass Effect 2, it seems Cerberus has always been independent. In fact, I can't seem to find any information about Cerberus being related to the Alliance, even after ED grants us access, which is really weird. Actually, even if you didn't do any Cerberus missions in Mass Effect 1, everyone seems to know about them. Cerberus encouraged the Alliance to co-develop the original Normandy. This makes it sound like it wasn't part of the Alliance, even before the first Normandy was created. If a sole survivor, Shepard can mention about his traumatic experience on a coup, but doesn't seem to care or put any kind of resistance or bring up the topic with the head of the organization, despite the entire plot revolving around this shadowy group's motives. In fact, talking to Miranda lampshades all the bad things they've done, even though Tally and Garrus bring some of it up, it never becomes an issue. I know we've got a job to do here, but come on, this is prime conflict and possible character development. So it seems that Cerberus is unknowingly autonomous. Then there's unexplained things, like things just appearing when they shouldn't. In Mass Effect 1, Conrad Werner can get himself killed right off the bat. Yet in Mass Effect 2, he's always back and always comments that you pointed a gun at him even if you didn't. I know Conrad's here just for comic relief and to allow Bioware to poke fun at itself, but with the number of people that just so happen to know about us and just so happen to be on Ilium like these guys, now they're resurrecting Conrad too? Wait. Resurrecting Conrad? Oh, God. For Joker, in Mass Effect 1, his Vrolic Syndrome was only in his legs, and he needed leg braces and crutches just to get around. Bones in my legs never develop properly, they're basically hollow, too much force and they'll shatter. Even with crutches and my leg braces, it's hard to get around. Classify my case as moderate to severe. I was born with over a dozen fractures, hip, thighs, ankles, my bones were already breaking in the womb. Uh, I don't fly with my feet, Commander, so I'm fine as long as I'm in this chair. It all got the asses kicked by the sickly kid with the creaky little legs. In Mass Effect 2, it now appears to be in his entire skeleton. Watch the arms! Which sounds like he'd have problems breathing. I think I broke a rib. Or all of them. Yet, he can fire an assault rifle, climb down ladders, and walk around without crutches or braces. To add insult to injury, Shepard can pick up a series of body upgrades regarding strengthening one's bones and skin to make it more durable, yet doesn't share this technology with Joker. 